This is part four of our lecture series on attorney-client privilege. And here we're going to be talking about a case, a landmark decision in the area of attorney-client privilege law. And it's the Upjohn case, or sometimes you'll see this as the Upjohn doctrine. And I want to say something about this to my students really quickly. If you covered attorney-client privilege in your evidence class, I almost guarantee the Upjohn case was one of the cases in your evidence book. And it's one of the most important cases in this this area. The second thing I want to say is attorney-client privilege, make sure you get this, gets very complicated when the attorney is representing a large organization like a corporation. Um, <clears throat> because there's all these people and some of them the conversations can have privileged conversations with the lawyer and some of them the conversations are not privileged and so this can get very confusing for the lawyer and for the client second thing is when you are in practice most of the um court opinions like let's say appellate opinions or litigation about attorney client privilege is actually about a privilege with corporate clients. And so the, the corporation situation is very confusing and messy. There's a lot of uncertainty and it generates most of our new case, our current cases about this and some of the aspects there's circuit splits um, about and so forth. So this is, kind of, there's a lot of unsettled area of law. Upjohn is a settled law, but it left a lot of unanswered questions as sort of the Upjohn progeny. So let's go and talk about the case really quickly. It's a nice um, case with nice facts that kind of illustrate the, the nature of the problem. So Upjohn, if you're unfamiliar with the company, this is an international, a very large international conglomerate um, that's mostly chemical. It's a chemical company and related industries. And so, so sort of if my students are familiar with Dow Chemical um, or uh, Procter Gamble or some of these companies, Upjohn is one of these companies that it, they're, they're, they make chemicals and other industrial supplies. Um, they had a problem. Upjohn had a problem that they found out in one of their overseas offices that a mid-level manager had bribed a foreign government official or officials in order to get some government contracts or con uh, a waiver of customs or something like that. Basically had bribed local officials. Well, we have laws against that here. We have laws against Americans bribing foreign officials overseas with American corporations. So Upjohn realized they had a problem and the board of directors asked their lawyer, their general counsel to do an internal audit and figure out this. So they knew they were going to be in trouble with the feds. And they wanted to find out if this was an isolated incident and they could just fire this one bad apple or if this was actually a widespread problem in their overseas offices around the world. Um, and so they, um, they had the lawyer do the survey and the, what the lawyer did is he sent out confidential questionnaires to all the foreign and area managers inquiring as to information regarding payments to local government officials, to foreign officials, um, to figure out um, how widespread this problem was. Um, at the time, the lawyer explained that this was highly confidential. He also explained that he was, had been asked to do this by the board, by the, the, the directors of um, the, the corporation at headquarters, and that there was anticipated, um, an anticipated enforcement action by the feds, and that's why we were looking into it. So people knew that there was a legal issue and um, that this was confidential. They were supposed to send their answers directly to the lawyer and not talk to anybody else about it. And that the lawyer was acting at the behest of the corporate directors. So then um, as they, and they figured out how widespread the problem was. Upjohn then volunteered this information to the IRS who was the agency um, bringing in enforcement action against the company over this incident. So when the enforcement action uh, finally uh, comes up, Upjohn says, by the way, we did an audit. And you can just imagine them saying, look, we did an internal audit to figure out how widespread the problem was. We identified the problem person or people. This was isolated and we've contained the problem. We fired the people and it won't happen again. Well, the IRS said, wow, we'd really like to see those questionnaires. That would be useful information for us. You'd save us a lot of work. 
from doing our, you already did our work for us by investigating how, um, all the offices to see where this has been going on. So they wanted um, these surveys, the survey responses um, to be turned over. And Upjohn said that the documents were protected by attorney client privilege and attorney work product. And they argued in the alternative. And we haven't, the, um, I haven't done the video yet, or, or you haven't watched it yet for work product doctrine, but I wanna take a moment and explain what's going on here because there's something rich about this case. Um, <clears throat> This case hits the Supreme Court in 1981. And at the time, it was really not clear that privilege would cover these conversations. And the reason is when you represent a, a large organization like a corporation or um, a, a university or something like that, um, you represent the entity and privilege will only apply to your conversations with the person or persons who are legally authorized to act on behalf of that entity. It doesn't apply to your conversations with everybody in the organization. The same is true when you're in-house counsel um, at a corporation, that your day-to-day -day chit chat with um, all of the other people in the building, those are not privileged conversations. The conversations are when someone who is authorized to act, to take legal action on behalf of the corporate client, the entity is the client, that will be privileged. And so the problem here is that in the Upjohn case is that the lawyer had communicated with all of these mid-level management people um, in overseas offices. And so the conversations with the board would have been privileged, but it really wasn't clear that the conversations with the mid-level managers um, would be. It was a close case and we'll, you'll see what happened in a moment. In the alternative, they asked for a work product. Now, work product would definitely have applied even though the lawyer um, was talking to, um, to lower level employees, right? So that's not the problem. Um, work product has doctrine has its own problem, which is um, that if the other side can show we really need this information, there's no other way to, for us to get it. It's kind of prejudicial if we don't have it, then it, it's it's really kind of flimsy. And so uh, work product protection. And so they would have, they, it was not clear that either would work. So they argued both. Let's go back and see what happened. The, um, the Supreme Court held um, that privilege applied to these communications. Why? And by the way, um, your, the Supreme Court, like the people that, uh, reporters that draft, put the syllabus at the beginning of opinions, broke the holding down into three points. You're going to see for a moment the restatement and a lot of your evidence case books and study aids are going to have it as four points. But just look at what we have here. First of all, it's a communication um, by corporate employees to the attorney acting at the direction of the corporate superiors to secure legal advice. So there's a whole bunch packed into just that first sentence. The lawyer is acting at the behest of the directors. It's a conversation with the employees, not outside. And it's about a legal matter, right? The attorney hasn't been asked to uh, plan the summer picnic. This is about a legal matter. Um, so, and then first, the info, uh, the information is concerning those employees' corporate duties, right? He's not just, a, this isn't the a fantasy football league or, so, uh, um, uh, or a betting pool or something like that. Um, second, the employees are aware that the information sought from them was to obtain legal advice and the communications were considered confidential when made and were thereafter kept confidential by the corporation. And so the Supreme Court said, if all these factors are met, we will apply privilege even to conversations with lower level employees where the conversa regular, routine conversations with low level employees would not be um, protected by attorney client privilege. The restatement in, in section 73 of the restatement of the law governing lawyers, um, as I said, breaks this into four points. Uh, just to, in case this is clearer for you. When a client is a corporation or other organization, privilege extends to a communication that one, otherwise qualifies as privilege. Um, two is, so let's say none of the privilege exceptions apply like crime or fraud or things like that. Um, it's between an agent of the court organization and a privileged person, the privileged person being the, um, uh, uh, let's say the lawyer. Um, and it concerns a legal matter of interest to the organization 
and it is disclosed only to privileged persons and other agents of the organization who reasonably need to know of the communication in order to act for the organization. That does not sound as interesting as the way the Supreme Court put it, but this is sort of distilling um, the Upjohn doctrine as it has evolved since the case. And there's now, trust me, a whole body of law about this. And if you start researching this, there's a lot of cases um, about how to apply Upjohn. And I want you to think about, for my law students for a moment, that each of these factors, let's go back for just a moment, um, look at those factors. We're going to, if you, we're still going to sometimes have questions about whether the lawyer was really acting at the behest of the corporate directors. We're going to have questions about, does this apply to independent contractors? Are they close enough to being employees? We're going to have questions about, um, uh, again, which employees really qualify, which conversations qualify, and so forth, even to see if it fits under Upjohn. Um, here's a couple other points about corporate clients. Whistleblowers and disgruntled lower level employees talking to in-house counsel about a legal issue they've observed in the workplace might not be privileged because this, this was not done at the behest of the corporate directors. And the same applies to written complaints from lower level employees not submitted under the purview of directors from the management. So let's say the management sends out an email saying, okay, we think we have a problem with sexual harassment in our um, workplace. Anybody who b believes that they have been a victim of sexual harassment or has observed it, please um, report it to our lawyer immediately right now. We're trying to gather all the information about all the incidents. That might be protected by privilege, right? It's put out, it's an internal communication at the behest of the directors, and it's kind of clear that this is a legal matter and so forth. Now, you're, a, you're just a whistleblower and you go and complain to the lawyer about something from the bottom up probably not a privileged communication. The lawyer could be forced to disclose the contents of the conversation um, later on. The other thing that this is our last slide, and so I just wanna say one other point um, uh, for my students. We, we have a lot of issues with lawyers who wear more than one hat in the corporation. And so you have organizations where general counsel is also the head of HR, human resources, or um, corporate counsel is also the CFO or has some other title. And so they, do, because there's not enough legal work, I guess, for them to be a full-time job. So they do that and they have knowledge in another area that's useful to the corporation. And this means that when they're in a meeting, some of the stuff they're saying they're wearing their lawyer hat and other stuff they're wearing their financial analyst hat or their human resources hat or whatever. And this can become very confusing for or which conversations does a privilege apply to? And so uh, the same is true as a lawyer, you're at a corporate meeting and you're there in case they need legal advice, but they turn to you and ask what you think of their new product line or they show everybody the new ad that they're about to start running on TV for their um, products or services and they wanna know what you think of the new commercial. And um, that's not legal advice. And so, um, again, there's a circuit split about this, and the majority rule seems to be that we're going to look at what was the primary purpose of the conversation, but this means that you could have said something legal in the midst of a conversation that was about a whole bunch of other stuff, and so therefore it's not going to be the the part that where you gave them legal advice wasn't privileged. Um, just watch out for that. We have a lot of unanswered questions and we get a lot of new cases about um, this. The other reason that we get a lot of privilege, attorney-client privilege cases about corporations <laughs> is the reply all button on emails and, so, and the CC button is that people start these email threads and they lose track of who's on the recipient list. And if some non-privileged people in the company are getting that email, are seeing this communication between the lawyer and the managers, it probably won't be privileged. Okay, that's enough about that. And, um, and that concludes our videos about um, attorney-client uh, uh, privilege.